So as we all know, um, Canadians are living longer these days, and population is aging, and housing needs are evolving. So in terms of Canadians living longer, um, according to Statistics Canada, in early 1970s, so between 1970 to 1972, um, men were, uh, the life expectancy for men was 69 years, and for women, it was 76 years. And moving that forward to 2009 to 2011, that life expectancy increased for men by 10 years. So it went from 69 years old to 79 years old. And for women, it changed from 76 years old to 84 years old. So that's a big jump in terms of life expectancy. And um, in general, we said population is aging. So in 2015, close to 11% uh, of the population uh, was between the age 70 to 89 years old. And 27% were actually baby boomers uh, with the age of 50 to 69 years old. So if we move this forward and look at what happens in 20. 30, um, in the year 2030, our baby boomers are going to start being in their seniors age. So they'll be at the minimum 65 years old. And in 2015, uh, close to 17% of the population was older than 65. But uh, in 2035, one in four people will be more than 65 years old. So once people uh, start getting older, they uh, have to start thinking about whether or not they want to stay in their own homes or move out and uh, um, go to a senior's housing residence. So according to a poll that was done in 2013 by RBC, uh, asking people whether or not they prefer, asking seniors whether or not they prefer to stay at home or move out, actually majority of people wanted to stay uh, at home and maybe uh, uh, ask for home care. And uh, majority of people didn't want to leave their homes. And uh, this was also evident in the census that was done in 2011. So in this, uh, in this census, they looked at um, seniors who were uh, older than 75 years, and they found out that 88% of uh, these seniors actually decided to uh, stay at home and not move out, and 12% decided to live in uh, collective dwellings. So uh, what are collective dwellings? Well, many of these dwellings are actually nursing homes and uh, chronic care homes uh, or long-term care homes. So 7.5% out of these 12% actually decided to live in these type of dwellings. And 4% uh, of them uh, were residences for seniors housing. And actually, uh, the survey that we do at CMAC mainly focuses on uh, these 4%. So what we take into consideration in our survey, actually, is that we make sure that uh, the building that we are surveying has been in operation for seniors housing for at least one year, uh, and that they have at least five rental units uh, for seniors. And another factor is that they make sure that more than 50% of uh, the residents in these seniors ho senior homes are uh, above 65 years of age. So um, we actually include some numbers from BC stats in our uh, survey uh, that we do, or in our tables in the uh, seniors housing survey. And According to BC Stats population estimates, in 2015, there were 357,000 seniors uh, that were above the age of 75 years. And majority of uh, these seniors lived in the Lower Mainland. So 54% lived in the Lower Mainland, 22% lived in the Vancouver Island, and 16% close to Okanagan, Thompson, and Shushwap. 
and 88% lived in other parts of BC. And again, it's interesting to see that in 2000, 2035, so 20 years from uh, last year, this number of seniors is going to more than double. So there will be 771,000 seniors in the year 2035. Um, so one of the things that our survey takes into consideration is the capture rate. So the capture rate is the number of uh, seniors living in seniors housing. So uh, the number of residents divided by the population uh, who are aged uh, above 75 years old. And in 2015, this number was the highest that uh, we saw since 2009. So 8.5% of these seniors were living in seniors housing compared to 8.2% the year before and 7.3% in 2009. So this shows that there was a higher demand for seniors housing uh, last year. And in general, if we look across Canada, um, the capture rate had actually increased in uh, most provinces. As you can see, I have like a green mark by uh, the percentage, meaning that uh, it had gone up in most provinces. And actually, BC had the second highest uh, capture rate. So uh, the first one was actually Quebec at 18.5%, and the second was, was British Columbia. So um, what does our survey uh, look at exactly? Uh, we mainly look at three types of housing. Uh, one is independent living spaces. So independent living spaces are those spaces that provide up to one point hours of care. And uh, other amenities such as exercise facilities, um, housekeeping, and uh, meals. And some of these independent living spaces are non-market, which means that they are subsidized by, uh, for example, the government. So the rent for these non-market spaces are usually lower. And the last one is heavy care. So heavy care spaces are those uh, where they provide more than 1.5 hours of care in those facilities. And um, usually people that need more care live in these kind of units. Uh, for example, people that have Alzheimer's or dementia uh, usually tend to uh, live in heavy care homes. Now, if we divide up uh, the number of spaces, which was above 30,000 uh, units last year, most of these units were independent living spaces. So 55% were non-subsidized independent living spaces and 18% were subsidized uh, independent living spaces. Uh, the rest were 23% heavy care homes and 4% uh, were, were unknown spaces. And something else that I should note here is that there were also 21,000 Heavy, uh, heavy care homes that were 100%, uh, they, they provided 100% um, heavy care units and they were not included in our survey. So in general, the vacancy rate had declined compared to the year before and there were only 6.1% of these units uh, vacant in the year 2015. And um, the vacancy rate for independent living spaces was 9.1%, uh, and the average rent for these homes uh, in British Columbia was close to $2,900. So it cost a an average of $2,900 to live in these homes because of uh, the amount of care and other facilities that they provided. And this rate was actually um, lower for heavy, ca uh, heavy care homes. So the vacancy rate was 1.8% for heavy care. And the average rent was much higher, so almost double uh, the average rent for independent living spaces. It was uh, just a little bit above $6,000. So first, let's talk about heavy care. So according to a survey that was done by Statistics Canada on disability, they found out that um, 
eight out of 10 people that had some kind of disability actually needed some kind of aid or uh, uh, assistive um, uh, care. And if we look at uh, those people who were 75 years of age or older, uh, for women, 39.8% uh, had some kind of disability and 44.5% uh, of men had, uh, sorry, the, other, the opposite, 39.8% of men had some kind of disability and 44.5% of women who were uh, above the age of 75. <coughs> they uh, had some kind of disability. So disability meaning some kind of pain or mobility problems or psychological or mental problems. So because of that, um, uh, we are seeing that the, we are providing more heavy care units for the seniors. In 2015, uh, there were seven, uh, more than 7,000 heavy care units in the universe, and that's 1,500 units more than what we had in the year 2010 for the seniors. And uh, in addition to that, we see that there has been an increase in uh, the average rent for these units because many of them are newer and, uh, for example, labor costs have been going up or uh, the cost of land has been going up. So that's why we are seeing a higher average rent for these units. And if we look across BC, uh, Vancouver Island had the highest cost of average rent, close to $6,400, followed by Lower Mainland at uh, 6051 and Thompson Okanagan had the lowest average rent at close to $5,200. Um, now, if we look at the vacancy rate uh, for these homes, is still very low, so uh, it was between 1.8% to 2.4% uh, across uh, different parts of BC, and uh, compared to the year before, it had only gone up by 0.3%, uh, so it went from 1.5% to 1.8%, which is still a very uh, low percentage. So now that we have covered heavy care homes, let's talk about independent living spaces. Um, so last year, uh, compared to, so 2015 compared to 2014, we saw that there was uh, a decline in vacancy rate across most provinces in Canada. Uh, again, uh, showing that there is higher demand for seniors housing and these kind of units for the seniors. And if we uh, look at the percentage across BC, uh, it has been constantly decreasing since uh, 2013. So in 2014, this vacancy rate was lower and it went down even farther in 2015. And um, if we want to look at the lower mainland specifically, Again, we see that uh, we see the decline uh, throughout all the sub markets in the lower mainland, with Richmond having the lowest uh, vacancy rate at zero percent, which means that there are no more vacant homes available in Richmond, and Surrey and Delta area had the highest vacancy rate at 13.7 percent. So, because of this higher demand and uh, because we know that there is this higher demand, uh, there has been more um, independent living spaces uh, which have been uh, getting added to the supply. So if we compare the 2015 number to 2009, since 2009 there were 4,000 uh, units added to the universe. Uh, it didn't change much from 2014, but compared to 2009, there were 4,000 units. And in general, uh, there were close to 17,000 units available, or not available, there were out there in the universe for in terms of independent living spaces. So um, as you can see on this pie chart, majority of these independent living homes are actually one bedroom units. Uh, so. Two thirds are one bedroom units, close to 21% are uh, bachelor homes, and 14% are um, two bedroom homes. 
So some things that uh, independent living spaces provide to their residents are, uh, for example, internet, exercise facilities, some of them have uh, on-site medical services, and uh, many of them also provide three meals. So 47% provide meals, which is included in the rent. Therefore, as uh, I said before, the rents for these units is higher than the average rent because of these amenities and services that they provide. Um, uh, bachelor units were renting for close to $2,000, followed by one bedroom units for close to $3,000, and two bedroom units for uh, $3,900, so close to $4,000. And if we look at, um, uh, the average rent across BC, again, uh, Lower Mainland has the highest average rent because of the, mainly because of the cost of land here, uh, followed by Vancouver Island and Thompson Okanagan. And then um, if we look at the average rent across the Lower Mainland, as you can see on this map, um, there were three sub-markets in Vancouver uh, that had independent living spaces li uh, renting for more than $4,000. And those were South Surrey, White Rock, um, uh, Vancouver, and North Shore. In North Shore, uh, they had the highest average rent, close to $5,400 for these independent living spaces. And the rest were below $3,000 with Chilliwack area having the lowest average rent at close to $2,300. And if we look across Canada, um, BC had the, I think, fourth highest average rent across Canada. It was actually very close to um, Alberta and Nova Scotia. Uh, and Ontario had the highest at close to $3,300. So in BC, the average rent was $2,868 for independent living spaces. So to summarize, um, as we said before, seniors are a large and growing population. Uh, by 2035, there will be 771,000 uh, people with the age above 75 years old. Uh, aging population and economic and housing market conditions are fueling demand for seniors housing. As we saw, vacancy rate has been declining, showing that there is higher demand for, uh, for seniors housing. And seniors housing will continue to evolve in response <coughs> to changing needs and preferences of people. Uh, one thing that I should tell you, this is the last slide. Uh, we have done the seniors housing survey again this year, and our report will come out uh, in mid-June, June 15th. So if you want to find out the updated numbers for uh, this year, you can uh, look out for our uh, new publication in mid-June. Thank you very much. New questions? <laughs> Uh, we've got time for uh, a couple of questions from the audience if uh, people want to ask some questions. If you ask questions, can you go to the microphone? Don't be shy. Hi, I'm Nas Rob. Hi. Can you tell me what the chief driving factor is for demand for housing for aging? Is it infirmity, is it economic, or what? Thank you. Sure. Um, I think the main factor behind uh, the increase in demand for seniors housing is basically the aging population. So there are more people who are uh, getting older and are deciding to uh, live in seniors housing. And that's the uh, main driving factor behind the increase in demand for seniors housing. That's what I think. <laughs> uh, John Berg, I'm uh, one of the founding members of the credit union and the cooperative in which I live in here in Chinatown. What I'm saying is that we're proposing now 
to come up with a solution that's going to include not only housing for seniors, but for young people coming up who are looking forward. But we don't want to separate the elder from the young. Because one of the things that we found out very clearly that brought about a lot of real bad feelings among them, let's make the housing fit the needs of the people who are living there in as creative and as constructive human way possible. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Any other questions? One more question. If Okay, right. thank you very much, thank Aida. You. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, I'm very pleased to be here today uh, with uh, old and the new friends. And I uh, need to thank our host, SFU, again, for uh, uh, half us at this great event. I also want to thank the uh, gentleman who provided the, uh, the question, the comments that uh, technology for housing, for living, should not only for uh, design for only one age cohorts. And uh, it seems now in the trend is uh, what we call not just the aging in place, but also living in place, and more uh, age inclusive rather than just age friendly. So today I'm here to share with you uh, some of CMHC's researches about housing for Canadians who might be seniors, who might be young, but with a changing lifestyle. Uh, the fact is that life doesn't stand still. People age, families change, and so do our needs, especially when it comes to housing and the living. So today I will share with you uh, the uh, new trends in home automation and some assistive technology that help maintain seniors' independence. And since this month, May 2016, marks the adoption of the 2015 edition of the National Building Code in Canada, and there are many changes relating to uh, accessibility around houses, uh, I will share some of the major changes, especially to do with uh, stair safety. And then I will also share with you the newest CMHC research on the cost of including accessibility features in new modest homes. So let's get started. Um, Gloria asked me to talk about the uh, new trends in home automation. Actually, home automation has been around for decades. Uh, some of the technologies maybe you have already been very, very familiar with, such as a motion detector and uh, the uh, automatic lights turning on and off systems. But nowadays, with the spread of the uh, wide brand, uh, the wide brand uh, internet and the uh, 3G and the 4G wireless technology, uh, home automation has expanded to include the computer, uh, computerized systems using smart technology to allow residents or homeowners control aspects from any location using a smartphone or uh, a computer connected to the internet. It is a growing market. Uh, consumer reports predict that by 2020, which is not too far away from now, 37 billion smart products will be on the market and 75 million smart home systems will be installed worldwide. Devices and the systems that can simply plug into existing electrical uh, outlets can be easily installed by residents themselves and typically cost uh, between $100 and $300. While a whole house automation system typically costs more than uh, $5,000 and they usually need to be installed by professionals. Uh, home automation brings many benefits. Uh, it provides a greater personal convenience by allowing uh, residents to, to program the uh, different devices, systems, and amenities around the house that fit with their personal preference and the lifestyles. So I mentioned some of the technologies that you have seen uh, you are familiar with. That's including the motion sensor uh, to control the light, uh, lights turning on and off and automatic door, do uh, door locks. Uh, it reduced the water and energy uh, consumption and hence save costs 
For example, devices and uh, appliances can be programmed and uh, uh, such as uh, the uh, programmable thermostats and the windows. Uh, for example, air conditioning uh, can be turned off when a, a monitor the window is opened and uh, maintained open for a period of time and the air conditioning will turn uh, back on when this window is closed. And the other um, sensors including uh, detect the moisture level of plants and they send you a text message when uh, the plants need watering. <laughs> Yeah, that works for someone like me. I uh, always wanted to tell uh, when shall I uh, water my uh, plants. The system also offers uh, better home security and the safety uh, by detecting security and the safety issues and they respond with specific actions. Um, from the uh, widely used technology such as uh, smoke and the fire alarms, uh, burglar alarms, to the newer technology uh, which let uh, uh, homeowners to monitor activities in and around the house from a remote location. And the health professionals typically use the term environmental technology to describe, uh, uh, environmental uh, control to describe the technology since it is uh, especially useful for seniors, uh, people uh, with uh, disabilities, and the people living alone. So remote oversight can uh, monitor uh, behavior and the detect factors such as uh, the changing daily activities such as uh, turning on taps, flushing toilets, um, or any uh, unexpected absence from a bed or from a chair and the health uh, information uh, can be sent to the caregiver or health uh, care providers. Stairs. Stairs can be a, a potential hazard areas, especially for those who are visually impaired or having difficulty walking. So, um, in Canada, a large proportion of people who visit hospitals after a fall from or on the stairs are, are seniors. So when seniors fall, uh, when seniors fall, the consequence can be long-lasting and severe. So the 2015 National uh, Building Codes have over 43 uh, changes uh, to the codes, uh, mainly to enhance accessibility. And more than half of uh, these changes affecting housing and the small buildings are to do with uh, stairs, um, ramps, handrails, and the guards. So one of the major change uh, is to increase the run size of a step from the current uh, eight and a quarter inches to 10 inches. This will bring the uh, National Building Code in line with the uh, International Building Codes and as well to reduce the fall incidences. Research uh, indicates that a larger uh, run dimension will, uh, uh, will provide a better uh, foot placement and a better stability and can uh, reduce uh, uh, fall incidences by 64%. The new uh, building, National Building Code uh, also has more stringent uh, requirements for continuous handrails throughout the full length of the stairs and at uh, changes in directions. And CMHC also recommended to extend the handrail uh, at the bottom and the top of the stair and uh, also provide the tactile uh, factor, uh, uh, indicators to warn the user that the stair is coming to an end. So while we are promoting the accessibility features, one observation is people generally appreciate the uh, functionality of accessibility features. However, most of the time they are wondering how much more are they going to cost? And to answer this question, CMHC undertake uh, a study last year uh, on the estimate, uh, estimated incremental costs in new modest homes. These homes are modest in sizes and the features included. <laughs> Meanwhile, we identified the 60 universal features. 
These features uh, will uh, allow the residents to live and age independently uh, at home, while they uh, they will be and they will be more expensive or disruptive if not integrated at the initial construction stage. So five benchmark home types across five major cities in Canada, including Vancouver, Winnipeg, Toronto, uh, Montreal, and Halifax, have been studied. So depending on the city and the dwelling type, um, I'm showing the four uh, dwelling types here on the charts because we didn't get the full set of construction data for, con uh, for apartment units. So depending on the, uh, uh, the different uh, dwelling types in the city, uh, the incremental part of the costs represent between 6% to 12% of the base construction cost. So the takeaway here is, yes, it does cost a little bit more to include these accessibility features. However, it is not as expensive as many people had anticipated. The, stu the study also found that the majority of the features, which is uh, over 70% of the features, generated a cost below $500. And uh, over half of these features generated no or negligible cost, which are the costs b below $100. And I'll show you a few examples. Um, some features such as a lever door handle, lower windows with easy to operate opening and the locking systems cost typically less than $100. Some other features such as continuous floor, uh, floor covering in the entire kitchen and the, uh, um, uh, the off-center kitchen sinks uh, with uh, uh, the uh, drains plumbed to the back to offer full knee space, accessible knee space under the sink uh, would also co uh, cost between 100 to $500. Other examples included adding plywood around the bath bathing and uh, uh, toilet areas so in the future grab bars can be installed anywhere on these walls. About 8% of the uh, 60 universal features generated uh, an additional cost uh, between $500 uh, and $1,000. These included uh, planning uh, kitchen cabinets with a lot of drawers and the shelves to, uh, to allow future installation of a side swing uh, oven and with the sliding shelves underneath the oven to facilitate any hot elements coming out of the oven. About 10 features generated higher costs, which are costs uh, above $1,000. So these features are mainly to do with uh, the modification of the uh, layouts, the floor space, to add areas in the living spaces, in the kitchen, in the bathroom, and in the garage, mainly to allow full maneuvering space of a wheelchair or uh, uh, people using walkers. So for uh, more information about the research, including its hi uh, research highlights and the full uh, study report, uh, you could go to our website to uh, either using the uh, keyword search function or visit the uh, accessible and aging in place um, sector uh, in the business sector of our website or the aging in place in the consumer sector of our website. So just to wrap up my very brief uh, presentation, some final thoughts. Uh, people uh, live and visit our homes come in all shapes and sizes. They can be seniors, they can be infants with different abilities and the skills. So plan housing in the communities with many uh, possibilities that will help save money, costs, uh, save money, time, and inconvenience in the future when uh, future modifications are needed. And also, it does cost a little bit more to, uh, construct, to construct homes with accessibility features. However, by reducing the needs of moving, uh, homeowners or residents will be able to reap the benefits in the long term. Uh, not only because movings are expensive, 
there are also a, an em, a emotional and the social costs associated with uh, moving. So that does concludes my brief presentation. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, here's some of our resources related to aging in place and adaptable housing. So feel free to contact me or visit our website for more information. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. We've got some time uh, for uh, questions and, uh, and answers. Uh, we've got quite a few hands up. Please come to the microphone and yeah. just say who you are and ask your question. Um, I'm Peter Chan from the Richmond Senior Advisory Committee. So um, I think uh, smart technology should consider the principle of elder friendly. Yes. So, and also seniors are facing the degenerative process mentally as well as physically. So uh, I think something simple should be important. Uh, yes. Because I'm a senior now, when I press the button, uh, I sometimes I press the wrong button. So the whole TV, without the TV, I cannot see it anymore. <laughs> uh, sometimes I forgot the password. Uh, temporary, it's a temporary loss of memory that will make me, uh, if I enter into a smart, smart home, a lot of buttons, a lot of buttons, then I, I press the wrong button, then it will make me more, less convenient. That will defeat the purpose of making senior life more convenient. Well, thank you very much for the comments. This is very true. Uh, I didn't include the information in the presentation, but the large part of home automation includes the proper training for the residents to use the systems. And also, uh, I think that the major trend of the technology uh, uh, research is to enhance or improve the user experience to, to make it more straightforward, easy to understand, and uh, straightforward to use. So thank you for your comments. Eva Wadolna from Suzuki Elders. Hi. And I would like to, first of all, support the gentleman who spoke ahead of me, mm -hmm. because there is a whole generation of seniors who are not on the smartphone, and they still need to um, live safely in various yes. places. But as far as the Suzuki Elders group is concerned, mm -hmm. uh, you haven't mentioned single time climate change and possibility of electricity going down and how people will cope with it at that point. Also, there was no mentioning of a health impact of having so much electricity magnetic field in closed spaces. That's a very good point. Um, I don't have any uh, research studies um, to uh, share, but I'm, I will definitely look into that and uh, connect with my researchers in Ottawa and uh, share any information maybe via Gloria uh, to the audience today, with the audience today. Yeah. Thank you, I hope you do it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, my name is Watson Sido. Um, Hi. Ordinary guy. <laughs> <laughs> I have two questions for you. Yes. The first one is, um, I'd like to know if, um, if CMHC and other agencies can put more emphasis, information, and encouragement for elevators in existing and retrofit homes. Mm -hmm. I think the elevator are not that expensive, but they're confusing, and they would add a lot to being able to stay in a home. Yes. Um, there are several different technologies to help people moving uh, between floors. Uh, elevator is one of that. And uh, in uh, previous years, when we were promoting the uh, flex house uh, adaptable housing principles, uh, we encourage people during the initial construction or major renovation to maybe uh, install closets on different floors, but at the same location. So uh, if the budget or, uh, or, or time or other factors are, are are somehow preventing the installation of an elevator uh, at this time, but the, stack, the stacked um, uh, closets will allow the future uh, easy adaptation and installation of elevators. And there are other technologies such as uh, the stair lifts 
the chair lifts, the, the platform lifts. However, depending on the consumer's uh, uh, different preference, some people do think it's more um, easy to install and less uh, disruptive. If uh, you know the uh, elevator installation, if you don't plan uh, integrate the planning in the initial stage, it can be quite technically uh, challenging to install that. But however, some people are concerned that the chair lifts or stair lifts can create some institutional look. So it really depends on the homeowner's own preference. Okay. I, I don't know if that answers your questions, but just well, some information. It, it seems that not enough, it seems that not much attention is being paid to this by builders and um, regulators. Um, I, I mean, a, a stair lift is okay if you're sort of mobile, but when you get to running around on a scooter, you're not gonna run the scooter up the stair lift very well. True, yeah, yeah. Okay. Also, depending on the flight of the, uh, the, the the stair, if it's straight, it might be easier to install a chairlift. If uh, there are changes uh, in direction, um, then it might be more uh, challenging. That's true. I've seen a, a number of articles on the East Coast where they add a elevate, elevator shaft to the external of the building, mm -hmm. and yeah. that seemed to work out. My second question is for Aida, the first speaker. What is the satisfaction rate of people living in assisted housing? I do not know the answer to that, sorry. <laughs> I think some of us would like to know before we stick our heads in there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sounds good, I'll find out. <laughs> Mine is not really a question, more, more a comment. I, I'm, I realize that this is a conference on information technology, as well as uh, home automation. But what I'm concerned about is in a way what Peter mentioned earlier, the people who do not use this technology, who are not very much familiar with the computer systems, sometimes people are not even literate in the English language, and besides that, maybe not even their own native language. So those are the type of people, I think while I really appreciate this type of conference, those are the type of people who are being more and more left out, and those are the isolated and the seniors, and then with the new uh, the refugees coming, and the sponsorship class, the seniors, people's grandparents coming. I think it's becoming more and more difficult and we have that divide between what we are doing and people who can't use what all the technology that we have. People ask me sometimes, do you have a smartphone? By the way, I'm, I can do the email, but uh, take me time to, to do the typing or whatever, word processing. People ask me, do you have a smartphone? And I told them, no, I have a dumb phone. Understandable, yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, that's, that's uh, what my concern is, and I hope we are not leaving those people out. Thank Very you. good point, yeah, thank you. Yeah. No, do you have any comments? On uh, that? It's yeah. a very good uh, point that you've raised, uh, sir. Um, just to highlight something is that the Gerontology Research Center has just been uh, provided an award by the Social Science and Humanities Research Council to look at the digital divide that exists within our community. Uh, a lot of this is around age, but a lot of it's to do with socioeconomic factors and a lot of the, um, the, the factors that operate within society that marginalize certain people. And to be part of, um, of, of the opportunities that the digital world offers, we really need to address those. So that's an extremely good point that you've made. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we'll draw the session to a close. I'm, I'm sorry, we, 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 do, we do have to press on with the, uh, with the, with the event. Um, uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much to the two speakers, Elizabeth and Aida. <laughs>